Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Genesis chapter 4. The Bible says, Adam knew Eve. She conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gone to the man from God. And the Bible says, and she again bore another brother called Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time it comes that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto God. He brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. Somebody say an offering. And Abel... He also brought the first kings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Bible says, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so one gave an offering, another one gave the first king. Alright? One man gave a sort of first fruit, and another man gave a simple offering. And God had respect unto Abel, for his offering. And some people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I think that's not even in the legal revelation because in Hebrews then he comes and tells us, by faith, Abel gave a better sacrifice. Somebody say amen. But the Bible tells us, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth in his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? For if thou dost well, shall thou not be accepted. If thou dost not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And the Bible says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is your brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Hallelujah. Tonight I want to talk about something very deep. And I'm going to share a lot of scriptures. I'm going to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But as I'm sharing this, I pray that by God, he will give you an understanding, the full understanding of why you're going to hear these words tonight. This portion of scripture gives us the first murder in the history of humankind. And the first murder in the history of humankind was a blood brother that killed his own brother. And why did he kill his own brother? Because one man by faith gave a bigger sacrifice and God respected his worship. God respected his offering. God respected his seed. God respected his service. God honored his commitment toward God. The first murder in human history was the move of a man that was stirred in envy and jealousy because another man knew how to serve God. Never forget that. Because another man, his own blood brother knew how to serve God. How to serve God? How to serve God? The first murder was a result that one man connected to God and another man failed to connect to God. Yet both of them gave to God. The first murder was as a result of a man who found a deeper place and his positioning was changed in the spirit because he was accepted by God and another man felt wrath in his heart, angry in his heart that God had not accepted his offering. The first murder took place because 
One man lost the vision, the understanding. When God tells him, why are you wrote in your heart? No, you know that if you had done the same, you'd have been accepted by me also. All he had to do was to go back in his own stuff and bring the first fruit, or the firstling, or the best. And the father wrote, he would have been accepted. There was still opportunity for him to make right. But there was a darkening in his understanding to design that he could do like his brother. And God would have accepted his sacrifice. A worshiper was killed. A God seeker was killed. A seed of God was killed by his own brother. Why? Because one man was accepted toward God. But what seems like a story of two brothers, the death of one man by another, you are amazed at how this one story starts to produce and reproduce itself and represent itself and appear itself in other patterns of generations that were to come after in Israel. And consequently, at the end of it, you start to see what God was up to and what the devil was up to. Somebody shout hallelujah. But to understand that, we have to begin with what happens really. When a man comes in contact with God, when a man knows how to serve God, when a man knows how to give to God, and when I'm talking about giving, I'm not just talking about your money. I'm talking about of the giving of the self. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout amen. I'm talking about a man who knows how to move the heart of God by faith. The first fellow we see doing that, after the fall of man, was killed. So you ask yourself, what was the mind of God when he was observing this? What ran into the heart of God when he saw a man slay his own brother? What was the world to do? Let me help you understand the spirit at work here. Now, when God asks, where is your brother? My, my brother's keeper, da, 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 da. You know the whole story. And then later on, God tells him, you know what? You are cast from the ground, which opened up its mouth to swallow the blood of your brother. And he tells him that from today, when you till the ground, why? Because he's a tiller of the ground. If he was a shepherd, then his judgments would have gone in the direction of his profession, of his occupation, of his calling, of the anointing that God had placed on his life. But remember, the Bible says that Cain was a tiller of the ground. And so he put a curse on the wax of his hands. And so God tells him that when you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield and to thee has strength. And a fugitive and a vagabond thou shall be in the earth. And Cain says, you know, the punishment you've given me is greater than I can bear. But remember scripturally, the Bible says he was cast from the ground which opened its mouth. God did not cast Cain. The ground that opened its mouth to drink of the blood of the brother judged him because he was killing of that very ground. It was trying to tell Cain that you've gone against the order of the spirit. I hope you understand what I mean. The ground itself was communicating to gain that I can't yield to you. Because even what I yielded you to, or for you, or toward you, you did not know how to deal with. With this you have killed another man, yet I was available to give you more. Somebody said, Amen. And so he says, this punishment is so great for me. And he says, if anybody finds me, they will kill me. He says, no. Whoever touches you, I shall avenge seven times. So he puts a mark on Cain, and Cain departs from the presence of God. Now the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 4, from about 17, Cain knew his wife after he was out of the presence of God and went and built a city. And when he knew his wife, she conceived and she bare him a son called Enoch. Right? And the Bible says when Enoch was born, Cain built a city and calls the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Now let us look at the lineage 
of Cain. So Cain fathers Enoch. The Bible says in verses 18, Enoch begot Erad, and Erad begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methusael, and Methusael begot a fellow called Lamech. You understand what I'm saying? And these are just generations. And when we get to the generation of Lamech, Lamech is the first guy who introduces polygamy in scripture, by the way. He takes himself two wives, one is Ada and the other one is Zila. In verses 23, Lamech said unto his wife Ada and Zila, he tells them, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my heart. And if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. This is a man telling his wives that I have slain the man to his wounding. And if indeed the life of our father, great great grandfather, great 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 grandfather Cain was avenged seven times, God still puts a protection over me to avenge my life 70 fold if a man should touch me. In other words, in spite of our craziness and stupidity through the generations, there is still a grace of God that is still ready to avenge us because even in our foolishness, He still loves us anyway. But even though that is happening, God is trying to show us that it's five, six, seven generations down the road from Adam, all through from Cain down to Lamech, and you still see that there's a seed of death. There's something that is multiplying through the generations and carries a certain testimony of death, of killing innocent lives. Why? Because it was embedded in a seed and it was passed down into DNA into five, six, seven generations. But this was not Cain. That was the devil at work in the lineage of Cain. God had ordained these men to walk the right course. But Satan took advantage because he wanted to put a seed in man that would kill the worshiper. He wanted to kill the seed in humankind that would seek God a certain way, that would serve God a certain way, that would connect to God a certain way. Satan was provoked by a certain favor, a certain glory, and a certain presence. That is the reason why Abel was killed. Abel was killed because he connected to a certain anointing. Abel was killed because he connected to a certain glory. Abel was killed because he was connected to a certain power, a certain favor. And it came because God had respect unto his seed. Satan knew that if he can get a man who knows how to seek God a certain way, he has a problem. It doesn't matter how fallen human nature is. If a man knows how to find God, human nature can be redeemed. That was Satan's problem. That here was a fellow who knew how to touch the heart of God in spite of man's fallen nature. He had to clear him. So what did he do? He planted a seed in the brother. Not only did he plant that seed, and to show you how wicked this devil is, he had to make sure that he plants the seed into generations of the same man. Wherever Satan sees God move, he will want to create a certain counter attack on it. And it has been like that from the beginning of the world. Are you hearing me? And it's almost as though humankind has gone through too much, too much, over history, that it's almost as though they are going to be consumed. And when the devil thinks he has it all figured out, God still raises a standard. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so, we see this even go into the heart of Lamech. And some say, oh no, it's a poem, oh no, it's this and that. If it was so, then he would not have claimed the 70-fold protection of murder if this spirit of murder had not multiplied itself into the generations after. So that means these fellows killed innocent people. But it wasn't them, Satan. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And now the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4, verses 25, the Bible says, And Adam knew his wife, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, said she, has appointed me another seed 
instead of Abel, listen, who Cain slew. So Seth was not just a sad bone. No. There was a deliberate mind of God saying that they killed a worshiper. Let me compensate. They killed a man who seeks God. Let me create another life and put in it the same spirit that knows how to find me. In fact, the Hebrew translation for the name self is compensation. He that compensates. Amazing. Somebody shout amen. He that what? Compensates. You must know that God is able to compensate. Somebody shout hallelujah. You must know that God is able to compensate. God can put back anything you have lost. He is that kind of God. He can give you a thing in the place of what you lost. Because his purpose and desire for your life is bigger than what the devil can ever do in your destiny. Somebody said hallelujah. Some people think that when you lose something or somebody, that's the end of it. No. There is a God who can go back into the ages and manufacture and bring a compensation and bring a replacement and give you one in the place of. That is God. I'm talking of women who have buried their babies. The Bible says by faith women receive their dead. You can say, God, I lost one, but you can bring one in the place of. Whatever the purpose of that one was, you can bring one that fulfills the exact purpose. There is nothing you lose that God is not able to compensate. It's not there. But God did not just give them another child. No, he gave them another seed in the stead of Abel. Who came slew? God was working out something bigger. I say God was working out something bigger. I say God was working out something bigger. And when he did, he connected this seed that he had begotten out of this woman and connected it to the original plan he had for Adam. That is why the Bible says, in Genesis 5, 3, he says, And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness, after his own image. And that's the boy named Seth. That means Seth carried the seed, the nature of Adam, as was God's mind for humankind from the beginning. That is God. I say that is God. That is God. May God compensate anybody who believes for a compensation this year. I say it again in the name of Jesus. That may God compensate anybody who believes for a compensation this year of anything that you could have lost. Anything? Yes. With God, all things are possible. Believe him and say amen. Shout amen. Glory to God. So he brings a compensation, a substitution. Because man must continue seeking God. Man must connect to God. Man must keep a certain relationship with God. Because that's the only way redemption for human nature can come. And so he raises a man called Seth. Praise the Lord. And Genesis 4.26 says, And to Seth, to him also, he says there was a son born. And that man was called Enos. And the Bible says, and then began men to call on the name of God. What Satan wanted to kill, God watched for only a moment. Left the fellow to go. The blood went with the guy that killed. And then after he gets into Adam and Eve and says, no, we can read this very story. Because I need somebody who can connect to me. I need somebody who can seek me. I need somebody who can serve me. I need a spirit on earth that knows how to connect to me. He gives a woman a son called Seth. Seth has a son called Enos. And the Bible says that when Enos is born, what the devil was trying to kill is resurrected. Men began to call on the name of God. Somebody said amen. Now like we see the generation, when that is resurrected, Satan knows that he has lost with the generation of Cain. He can never build anything under Cain that can stand. Now he's looking at this lineage that knows how to seek God. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. And when you go in Genesis chapter 5 from about verse 6 up to the end of it, you see the generation again from there. You see Enos, he begets Canaan. Canaan begets Mahalalil. Mahalalil begets Jared. Jared begets Enoch. Now this is another Enoch. Not the Enoch in the lineage of Cain. The Enoch in the lineage of Cain was the firstborn, right? This one now is one, two, three, four, five generations from Seth, okay? And then Enoch begets Methuselah, and Methuselah begets Noah. And when he gets to the seventh generation, he says, and Noah found grace in the face of God. <laughs> <laughs> Who has understood what I just said? Methuselah was the oldest man that ever lived. Enoch was the one which walked with God and he was no more, for God took him. So he started to produce a lineage of men who have certain records, certain reports, certain testimonies with God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And then you see that the grace of God is flowing in every generation, in every dispensation. He's saying, I don't care what Cain is doing with his own stuff. I've still produced a lineage that will serve me. All God needed was a line that can stay connected to him. That's all he needed. Because he knew if that line can stay connected, salvation for humankind will come. Who has understood what I just said? And so we see that Noah has children, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then the world was wicked, if you remember the story, because of certain generations in that time. And the Bible says, God says, you know what? I think I'm going to clear away everything and just keep the lineage of Noah. Because by keeping that one fellow, I can continue in my plan to raise myself a holy people. Because it was desperately wicked. The Bible says it repented the Lord that he had created man. The floods come. They fill the earth. Giants are in the land. The sons of God had copulated with the daughters of men. And it was all wicked, mixed seed and all kinds of confusion. So the world is flooded. And after that flood, Noah is like a beginning of another story. When you look at Noah, of that generation... And then compare the Lamech of Cain. You see two different destinies. In fact, the Bible says they called him Noah. For the Bible says, for the parents said, For this shall comfort us concerning the ground that the Lord has cast. You understand? So, Noah was a spirit of comfort. Noah was a lineage to take or receive the grace of God. When the floods fill... Satan looks through these three boys of Noah and he says, I must plant a seed. I must continue with this thing. He gets into Ham, the son of Noah. And then one day after floods and everything, the man is drunk. And this guy comes and finds his father naked. And what does he do? He laughs. He scoffs at him. And the brethren shame and Japheth come with their backs toward their father and they cover him. And that day Satan knew that he had planted another seed in the lineage because he knows that if mankind continues seeking God a certain way, he knows the end of mankind is eminently salvation. He knows it. And so we see history repeating itself. We go into the generation of Ham. The guy who laughs at the father. In fact, when Noah woke up, the Bible says he knew what had happened. They told him, cast be Canaan. Cast be Canaan. I don't know why many people think that God cast Canaan. God did not cast Canaan. Noah cast Canaan. God does not cast man. God never cast Cain. The ground deed. Because he went against the law. Praise God. You understand what I'm saying? 
And so when you read in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6, it tells us that the sons of Ham are Cush, Mizraim, Fort, and Canaan, the guy who was cursed. And the Bible says, and the sons of Cush are Seba, Havila, Sabta, Rama, Septecha, the sons of Rama, Sheb, and Didan. And when we get in there, we see that even the one Noah cast is not the one who begets Nimrod. No. Cush, the firstborn of Ham, is the one who begets Nimrod in verses 8. And he began to be a mighty one in the earth. So this even has nothing to do with the curse Noah pronounced over Canaan. This had to do with the continuation of a seed the devil had deliberately wanted to plant in human nature. Because if it was through Canaan that Nimrod would be born, then we would think, huh, maybe it's because of the curse of Noah that Canaan now continues this evil thing. But amazingly, it's Cush, the firstborn, the Cushites, where the Ethiopians are. Canaan is the Egyptian, okay? Now, I'm not saying Egypt is, or that Ethiopians are. No, 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 it's bigger than that. It's not that they are so. No. No, no. Don't ever think like that. That is why Aaron and Miriam get it wrong when Moses marries a Cushite woman and they say, "Uh uh-uh, this is not God. And guess what? Miriam is hit with leprosy. And Aaron was judged to accept that he had a mantle, a garment of the priesthood. And the day it was taken off him, he fell dead. Why? Because it's not about the Cushite. It's not about the Egyptian or the Canaanite. No, it's about what Satan was trying to do in a lineage. It's not them. I'm not saying that those nations are evil. No, I'm only trying to say that they come from there. Are you hearing me? We all come from something. Hello? Hello? And some people have used that doctrine to darken the continent of Africa. To say that the descendants of Ham went there, therefore Africa is this and that and that and that. No, no, no. God never cast Africa. God never cast Canaan. No. In fact, Noah blessed all his three children. Even Ham was blessed by Noah. Ham was never judged or cast by Noah. So if Ham was never judged or cast by Noah, then you can't use his lineage to say that all of them are of the cast because their father stayed blessed. Noah blessed all the three. But do you know that those are some of the things that were used back in the day? And partly this story is the reason why later on some people cook up stories in Rwanda why the Hutu and the Tutsis fought. Do you know this story is a bit interlinked? That people can use such things and destroy the lives of innocent people because they don't know what the Bible says. God never cast harm. Somebody shout hallelujah. So anyway, Kush begets Nimrod. In verses 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Where it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, the Bible says the beginning of his kingdom, Nimrod, was Babel, which is Babylon, which means confusion. And now you see that what God was trying to fight in the generation before has come through Noah's boy. And Noah has begotten a Cush, and that Cush has begotten a Nimrod, and that Nimrod has brought back demonic worship. Babylon is built, the system, the empire, the spirit that still rules in the world of tents, in this physical realm, is Babylon. It's Babylon. It's Babylon. The nature of it, the understanding of it, the interpretation of it, the systems of it, the ways of life of it, and everything we see is Babylon from Nimrod. Why? He knew that he wanted to continue to set men against God. In fact, the Hebrew word for Nimrod is rebellious. I wonder why he named his son so. What was in Cush's head when he carried that kid on the day he was born? And he said, rebellious. (laughs) That means there was something set in his soul to produce something that would set itself against God. If you have understood it, shout amen. But God still had a plan. He goes to the firstborn of Noah, Shem, and produces descendants through. 
And that's where we find the terrors. And terror, which then fathers the Abrahams. So Abraham comes through the lineage of terror. And God is saying, no, regardless of what you do through my people, I'll still raise the people that will connect to me. He finds a man like Abraham, which is worshipping the sun. And he tells him, oh, leave your family, leave your kinfolk, leave your relatives. And remember by that time of the terror day, the days of terror, they are disconnected from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God still had the connection with the lineage of Shem. And what does he do? He gets a boy out of there, Abraham. And then he tells him, get thee out of your country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, and to a land that I will show you. And then he takes him to be an inheritor of the one which Noah cursed, Canaan. Who has understood what I just said? The land. You understand? So where Noah cursed, God says, no, I'm going to begin from there and raise a patriarch. In Canaan. And Canaan means lowly land. Are you seeing what God is trying to do? He's saying, wherever even Noah pronounced a curse, let me begin from there and give a man a vision that will further the whole world. God is still trying to work out something. And if you're a reader of the Bible, I guess you already see the difference. You see the dichotomy. You see the message, love versus grace. You start to see it very clearly as you start to read the Bible. It's this Abraham that is the sign of the covenant that he makes with human beings. And before we know it, he begets two boys, Ishmael and who? And Isaac. And again, a war falls between the two. Satan wants to use one. And before we know that, Ishmael is coughing at Isaac, which is the seed of the promise. Hagar and the son are gotten rid of. Isaac is raised as a boy, and before we know that, he is the sign of circumcision. And as though that's not enough, he begets two boys, Esau and Jacob. And before we know it, they still a war between the two. As God is trying to run his agenda, Satan is running his own also. One boy sells his birthright for a muzzle of meat. Why? Because Satan has placed the seed of confusion in that young man. And God has a plan through Jacob. Are you hearing me? And before we know that, as though he's running away from Esau, he falls in the hand of Eleven. Who torments him for years, forces him to do polygamy. You understand? Satan is trying to work out something. But God has a bigger plan for it. Somebody shout hallelujah. Before we know that, Jacob begets how many? Twelve boys. Which are the twelve tribes of what? Of Israel. We start to see that these boys are now against one fellow, Joseph. Because God had put something on Joseph for a continuation of this posterity of men which seek God. Men which connect to God. And before we know that, his brothers are selling this fellow. They're throwing him in a ditch. He's in prison. He's a governor. Before we know that, reconciliation has come through. God is working out something in every lineage. He knows who to get. He knows who to preserve. Because he has the bigger picture of the salvation of humankind. Jacob is old, Israel. And as he's old, Joseph brings two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. The elder is put on the right. The younger is put on the left. Because God knows the picture. Jacob has connected already. He knows what his father went through. They are connecting. They know that God must preserve himself a seed. Mm, he crosses the hands. For oh, my father, not so. For the right hand is supposed to be on the older one on the left. He says, ah, 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 my son, I know. But he did not ask him, what do you know? He's trying to tell him, I know that God must preserve one of these to preserve a posterity for men which seek after God. And like I said, if you study this from beginning to the end, you'll realize the two messages, the law and the grace. For example, Esau was human works. Praise God. Esau was human works. Ishmael was a representation of the law because Isaac was the son of the promise. When you read, it's amazing that all of these things are written, but God is trying to show us a certain picture. Somebody said hallelujah. And the generations continue like that. And before time up to now, that war has continued. It has not stopped. Up to now, that war still exists. That's why Jerusalem is being fought. That's why Israel is under attack. The physical one. <laughs> but you see, they are already late. Because God is working out a spiritual pattern and has worked out...
when Jesus was to come, he had to choose a lineage. He looked through eternity and said, uh -uh, I must choose a lineage. I must come as a seed of Abraham. I must come as a seed of David. This is the only way we can deal with this thing once and for all. Somebody shout amen. And in Galatians chapter 3 verse 16, the Bible says, And now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And it says, Not unto seeds as of many, but as of one seed unto thy seed, which is Christ. Now we see that God started to knit his purposes around a certain lineage. Because he had to connect it to fulfill this bigger picture. Somebody shout hallelujah. And that is why you start to see the total sum of things. In Corinthians 15, 45, he says that the first Adam was a living word. So, and he says, and the last Adam, he didn't say the second. He says the last, it ends here. Are you hearing me? Like that allegory between Cain and Abel. Are you hearing me? Is Cain is the firstborn. And then he kills Abel and I raise another one, which is Seth. And men begin to seek God. If I have to meet this together, I have to raise another fellow. And this one raise him once and for all. Now you understand why Jesus was crucified. So Jesus walks the surface of his earth and he knows no. Whatever killed Abel is going to seek me. <laughs> Whatever killed Abel is going to seek me. But as it plans to seek me, let me carry all your sins. Let me bear all your transgressions. Let me put a nut in the scriptures for cursed is he which is hung on the tree. That when I'm put on the tree, I shall not only become the propitiation of the sins of you, of you, of you I shall also become the curse. That mankind will be saved both from the curse and the bond of iniquity and its consequences. What killed Abel has to look for the Christ. That is why when the prophet sees it, he says, Oh, behold the Lamb of God which was slain from the foundation of the world. Why? Because he knew this thing was knitted from the beginning. We knew the end of it. For this cause came I into this world. To this end was I born. I knew everything that was going to happen. My life was not taken. I gave it. I knew what I was doing. I knew what I was doing. Satan thought he was killing. No, he wasn't. And I can imagine Jesus on the cross. And he doesn't know that this one man is becoming the substitute. The propitiation of our sins. Somebody said hallelujah. The perfect sacrifice. The lamb that was without blemish. God created a character. Because he knew what the devil wanted. No. He said this time round. Eh, let me deal with their sin. Let me deal with their weaknesses. Let me deal with their sicknesses. Let me deal with their pain. Let me deal with their diseases. Let me deal with their poverty. Let me deal with their trouble. Let me deal with their dismay. Let me deal with their temptation. Let me deal with everything that will ever disturb mankind. This is the last one. This is the last one. The man went to the cross. Peter wanted to interrupt the story. And he says, if they kill you, I will die. He says, hey, hey, Satan, get thee behind me, for thou sufferest the things of man and not the things of God. You don't know what I'm up to. I'm trying to purchase eternal salvation. This time it has to end. It has to end. The man goes on the cross. And he dies for our sins. And in Galatians 3.27 he says, For as many as of you who have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. And he says here, There is neither Jew, Gentile, Ethiopian, Egyptian, Ugandan, Randese, American, Portuguese. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ, he says, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And 
now what I'm trying to do is, I want to finish this thing in one man. And put you in one man. That when he dies, you die with that man. Are you hearing me? And that when that man raises, you are raised with that man. Hallelujah. In that man is the fullness of all that filleth all things. And he says, and ye are complete in that man which is the head of all principality. That man has God. He is a hundred percent God. So it pleased God that in that man should dwell all the fullness of God bodily. Did you get it? He says, this time I'm not going to raise a man. This time I'm going to enter a body of a man and my whole fullness is going to enter there. That is the only way I can end it. That is the only way that man can be killed and then he comes back from the dead. This is Jesus. Then when he goes in hell, the Bible says he makes a public spectacle of the devil triumphing over the devil are you hearing me and after slapping them silly the bible says he's given a name above all names that at the sound of that name every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of the father in him you live in him you move in him you have your own being what do you think the devil sees when and he looks at you. When Paul saw that life, he says, Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph and he maketh manifest the suffer of his knowledge by us in every place. We are hard pressed, but we are not destroyed. We are perplexed, but we are not dismayed. He says, We are always moving in the testations. But he says, But brethren, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us, for the promises of God are yea, and in him, amen, to the glory of Christ. When he saw that man, he says, and all things for you can only work together for good. For them that love the Lord, and they are called according to his good purpose. For he that began that work in you, he shall see it to accomplishment to the day of Christ. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. Tell your neighbor, I will finish well. When the Son of God was on the cross, he said, it is finished. It is finished. You will never kill another. Now the Bible says that the veil was torn. Now we have the grace to access the presence of God. The law came by Moses and grace and truth came by Jesus. Now the Bible says the promises were given and God made an oath and by these two immutable things, the Bible says, of which it is impossible for God to lie. The Bible says these things are our anchor. These things are our anchor. These two immutable things. The Bible says they are our anchor. The anchor that's in the Holy of Holies. It means you are not just someone who enters the holiest presence of God. You are anchored there behind the veil. Hallelujah. And the Bible says for where Jesus, our forerunner, has gone in advance for us. That means he dealt with anything that could ever separate you from the presence of God. No wonder Paul says nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Not death, not life, not things present, not things to come, no angels, no powers, no height, no depth, no pressure shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is revealed in Christ Jesus. And it says to which was God in Christ reconciling man to himself not imputing sin but imputing righteousness on them and now he says and now brethren we beseech thee you as ambassadors of Christ the Bible says we have obtained a ministration of reconciliation and we beseech thee by God be ye reconciled to God the Bible says for God wanted to make himself one new man thereby doing what removing the dividing wall 
For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old things are passed away, and now new. And the next line says, and all things are of God. Woo! Who has reconciled himself to us by God? We are of the winning team. We are of the victorious team. We are of the advantaged team. We are of the conquering team. We are of the wisdom team. We are of the power team. We are of the glory team. We are of the strength team. Oh, somebody shout amen. He did it. Tell your neighbor it is finished. It means we will never die on the altars of worship. We shall never be ascended on the altars of prayer. God will never abandon us on the altars that seek him. For any man that seeks him, he shall find him. Any man that knocks the door, that door shall be open. For I have learned and perceived of a truth that God is no respecter of persons. He says, for any man that comes to me, I shall by no means cast away. But when they enter me, he says, no man shall be able to pluck them out of my hand. Tell your neighbor, I am one with God. Oh! Jesus finished it. I say Jesus finished it. Jesus finished it. And then he made an open conversation. He said, look, anybody who is tired of the other life, just come in. When you became born again, you must understand. You are not just born again to go to heaven. Even on the earth, you're going to live a very good life. Even on the earth, you're going to live a triumphant life. Thanks be to God. Who always calls, always, 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 always causes us to triumph in Christ and make us manifest the power of his knowledge by us in every place. And now we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Oh, hallelujah. Given everything that pertains to life and godliness. Oh my God, I feel it. And this is love made perfect, that you might have confidence on the day of judgment. For as he is, so are we in this world. And this is the record, that the Son has life. And whoso has the Son has life. I have the life of God. The thing that could not leave Jesus in hell is seated inside you. The thing that conquered hell and the grave is seated inside you. It is walking inside you. It is talking inside you. It is praying inside you. If it could not resist the power of Christ in hell, if it could not hold him in hell, it cannot hold you anywhere. Brethren, for all things, Paul says, are for your sake. All things. Even if the landlord sets you out of the house, ah, it is working for your good. Paul says that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. I don't care what you've gone through. I don't even care about your past. I'm looking at your present and future now, and it is bright enough that I need sense. I don't care what the devil has took you through over the years. I came to tell you this evening, begin now and start to write your story. Tell your neighbor you can begin now and finish well. How can this news not excite you? How can this not stir you? A born again believer was not made to suffer. No, that's not the gospel. No, no! I refuse to suffer in this world. And definitely I won't suffer in heaven. 
Somebody said hallelujah. I know who I am. I know who is inside me. I know what is working inside me. Now that is why you had attacks when you were growing up. That is why you were messed up. That is why you messed up. That is why things hit you. That is why sicknesses came. That is why attacks came from right, left, and center. Satan knew what he was up to. But man become San Diego. He has not killed you. And he's not about to kill you. For you know the truth. And the truth makes you For he that began that work in your life he will see it to accomplishment to the day of Christ speak to yourself and say I will never fail Jesus was the last I say Jesus was the last God was tired and he said let me seal this once and for all it's grace versus law for the letter kill it <laughs> but the spirit give it life somebody shout hallelujah <laughs> somebody say amen he came to bring sons to glory he came to give them the right to be called sons of God. How about that? Now, if they are my sons, touch them. When Peter saw that, he says, ah, the thing you've been begotten of, born not of corruptible seed, the seed in you, the one which begot you in the New Testament, that one cannot be corrupted like it sat on Cain. It cannot be corrupted like it sat on Ham. It cannot be corrupted like it ended Cush and Nimrod. That one cannot be corrupted. He says, you are born of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. That generation will never fail. Get it in your head. You're not going to fail. Think it in your spirit. If you believe God, you will never fail. There is nothing in you that can corrupt anything. He will never let his right to see corruption. No, he's so rot in hell. I will tell you this for a fact. You might not be there yet, but God is working all things together for your good. The Christian life is a life of victory. It's a life of triumph. It's a good story. Change the way you walk. I say change the way you walk. Yeah? Don't be apologetic for being proud of God because you are a child of God. Don't be sorry that you know you're rich. Don't be sorry that you know you're wise. Don't be sorry that divine help is yours. Don't be sorry that you're not conformed to the standards of this world because the Bible says you have been conformed to the image of God. If Jesus was the express image of the invisible God and you've been made to be conformed to the image of God, it means the way Satan sees Jesus is the way he sees you. You and Jesus are one. Ha, 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 ha. Tell your neighbor, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. God knew what he was doing when he sent Jesus. God knew what he was doing when he sent Jesus. And God knew that I have to live in a time after Jesus had come. What a glory! This gospel is so deep. It's so crazy. It's so beautiful. I want you to pray like a son of God. I say pray like a son of God. Thank you.
what has happened in your life. I don't care how bad. God still has his eyes on you. He still has plans on you. He still has purposes on you.
blameless on you. Because he knows if you live as a sinner, Satan will plant the seed. That is why he gives you grace. That you will live as a fruit of his redemption. That results will come through you. That you will live a moral life. That you will live a higher life than normal people live. That is your testimony. And so I decree upon you in the name of Jesus. That you are a new creation in Christ. And your person is not that of the fallen nature. For you have been redeemed by God. You've not been redeemed by corruptible things. You've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Who was without blemish. I decree and declare that you are in Christ Jesus. Of whom he has been made to you wisdom. Sanctification. Redemption. The glory of God is shining on your life. The power of God is evident on your life. The wisdom of God is increasing every other day in your life. You are far from curses. You are far from generational curses. You are far from failure. You are far from dismay. You are far from disappointment. He began that good work in your life. He will see to accomplishment to the day of Christ. You are born of the incorruptible seed. And what is in you? You live it and abide it forever. You conquer this world. You have dominion in this life. You are more than a conqueror by Christ which strengthens you. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. Your way is upward and upward only. For the path of the just shines brighter and brighter and to a perfect day. The message Bible says the longer you live, the brighter you will shine. Sound amen. Sickness is far from you In the mighty name of Jesus Divine health is your portion And you will walk divine healthy Your children will be healthy In Jesus name Say amen I have a good year this year A good month A good week A good night And a good morning tomorrow the angels of God are encompassing everything that I do. I am a success. I am a success. I am a success. This world is listening to me. I am a voice in this generation. Say it on your life. And there is nothing the devil can do. I know who I am and who he is in me. In Jesus' mighty name. Say amen. Glory to God. So if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, if you say, today I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, repeat this as after me. Say, Jesus, I thank you for the word. Tonight, I have heard that you came for me. You died for me. You were raised for me. With my heart, I believe. With my mouth, I confess that you are Lord of my life. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.